Um, so I'm just going to discuss some topics that are related to the 10 demands. I don't know, has everybody seen those 10 demands that yep. Rage Against the War Machine is calling for? And supposedly they were going to deliver them to Biden today in Washington, D.C. Are you familiar with the... Yeah, okay. So I won't go through them, but those... the, the Julian the, Assange. Yeah. Yeah, Julian that's, Assange. yeah. It's one of my topics, actually. Assange is one of my topics. So, um, the first thing I want to talk about are the costs. The costs of the Pentagon budget, the costs of the Ukraine war. And I've lost track of the total amount of taxpayer money that's going for the Ukraine war, but I know it's well over a hundred billion dollars at this point. And, um, think what we could do with, with that kind of money. And um, I know, I'll just say that um, the government could be using those funds for the people, and instead they're escalating war and creating a very dangerous situation for the entire world. I mean, we are putting the entire world in danger right now with nuclear, with the nuclear war that we're on the brink of. Another area where both Democrats and Republicans seem to have no problem agreeing to spend money is the Pentagon budget. I think this 2023 is somewhere around $858 billion is what Democrats and Republicans approved unanimous, almost unanimously. And that comes, the $100 billion for Ukraine, the $858 billion for the Pentagon budget, is almost that trillion dollar number that you mentioned, Bernie. The trillion dollars is that plus what it costs to keep the, the, the soldiers in hospitals and so forth. The, the other, yeah. other costs, that not everything's in the Pentagon budget. Right, it's that's right. It's one fourth of our budget. Huh? Yeah, and it's, it's more it than... It's one point four point seven trillion eight hundred fifty eight billion. It's one fourth of our, our budget. But more importantly, it's 50% of our discretionary It's more spending. than, more than. So, so like a lot of the money goes for debt, but 50% of our discretionary spending. More than is, 50%. Is spent on it's, it's actually over 50%. Yeah, what is the number? Uh, I don't have the exact number, but so I know it's, it's over it's, 50%. It's over 50% of our discretionary right, yeah. spending yeah. is for more. So, um, as Chris Hedges pointed out in one of his comments, I don't know if people know Chris Hedges, but um, the huge military expenditures, and this is a quote, which have driven the U.S. debt to $30 trillion, is $6 trillion more than the U.S.'s GDP. It will become untenable in the near future. And servicing this debt alone costs $300 billion a year. The U.S. spent more on the military in 2021 than the next nine countries combined, and that includes China and Russia. They spent $801 billion, which amounted to 38% of the total world expenditure on military. In addition, yeah, the 50%. So, so much of our money is being used for war, death, and destruction and displacement. People all over the world are being displaced because of this. And do any of us really believe these obscene ex military expenditures is keeping us safe? I mean, that's what we're told, right? But that's not the case. And speak, speaking of keeping us safe, I want to talk a little bit about NATO, because na disbanding NATO is another one of the demands that's being presented to Biden today. To quote Chris Hedges again, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and the arms industry that depends on it for billions in profits has become the most aggressive and dangerous military alliance on the planet. Created in 1949 to stop Soviet expansion into Eastern Europe and Central Europe, it has evolved into a global war machine in Europe, the Middle East, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. NATO expanded its footprint, violating promises to Moscow 
once the Cold War ended. It has incorporated 14 countries from Eastern Europe and Central Europe into the alliance. It's now in the process of adding Finland and Sweden. The U.S. government is well aware of Russia's valid concerns that NATO is attempting to encircle their country. In the past, NATO has bombed Bosnia, Serbia, Kosovo. It launched wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and Libya, which according to Costs of War, a study by Brown University, these actions resulted in close to a million deaths and 30, some 38 million people driven from their homes. NATO is building a military footprint in Africa and Asia. It invited Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea, the so-called Asia-Pacific Four, to its summit in Madrid at the end of June 2022. It has expanded its reach into the Southern Hemisphere, signing a military training partnership agreement with Colombia in, 20, in December 2021. It has backed Turkey with NATO's second largest military, which has illegally invaded and occupied parts of Syria and as well as Chirac, Iraq. So that's quite a record for a military alliance that should have been rendered obsolete and dismantled with the collapse of the Soviet Union. NATO and the militarists had no intention of embracing the peace dividend, as Chris Hedges called it, fostering a world based on diplomacy, a respect of spheres of influence, and mutual cooperation. It was determined to stay in business. It's a business, its business is war. That meant expanding its war machine far beyond the border of Europe and engaging in constant antagonism toward China and Russia. However, Vijay Prashad wrote in July of last year, most of the world rejects NATO's policies and global aspirations and does not wish to divide the international community into outdated Cold War blocs. Although NATO's member states may believe that they possess global authority, the overwhelming majority of the world does not. The international response to the war in Ukraine indicates that a large divide exists between the United States and its allies on the one hand and the global south on the other. Vijay Prashad stated that governments representing 6.7 billion people which is 85% of the world's population, have refused to follow sanctions imposed by the U.S. and its allies on Russia. While countries representing only 15% of the world's population have followed those measures. According to Reuters, the only non-Western governments to have enacted sanctions on Russia are Japan, South Korea, the Bahamas, and Taiwan and all of those host U.S. military bases or personnel. The U.S. and NATO should not be talking about escalation. They should be talking about de-escalation, diplomacy, and detente. And as Caitlin Johnston said, we needed that yesterday. Another demand from Rage Against the War Machine is to free Julian Assange. He is accused of breaking the U.S. Espionage Act by publishing U.S. military and diplomatic records pertaining to the Afghanistan and Iraq wars in 2010. That's what the U.S. says. Whereas in reality, he exposed U.S. war crimes in both countries. And fighting, by, and fighting extradition from London to the U.S., if he, is extra, if he is extradited to the U.S. and proven guilty, he faces up to 175 years in prison. Julian Assange's long-running legal battle began in 2010 after he published more than 500,000 documents classified in the U.S. regarding war crimes committed in Iraq and Afghanistan. Julian Assange has been held in Belmarsh, a maximum security prison, for almost four years at this point. Prior to that, he was homebound at the Ecuadorian embassy 
in London from 2012 to 2019. Although Assange was granted political asylum by Ecuador in 2012, he was never allowed safe passage out of Britain because he was the target of prosecution in the United States, by the United States. In 2019, he was arrested by British police at the embassy and taken to Belmarsh Prison. Now remember that Julian Assange is an Australian-born citizen. However, somehow he's been arrested by the British police at the Ecuadorian embassy and in danger of being extradited to the United States. Incredible. It's incredible. In 2020, in 2020, 117 doctors published an open letter in the medical journal The Lancet, and it was titled, End Torture and Medical Neglect of Julian Assange. So I feel like our group's getting really small, and I'm gonna, I think I'll just close here. And um, I'd like to read a poem. I had a lot more, but we'll do that another time. I'd like to just read this poem. It's, um, related to nuclear de-escalation. And it was written in 1955, 10 years after the United States government dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And it was written by a Tur the Turkish poet Nazım Hikmet. And it's translated, it's, it's in the voice of a seven-year-old girl. And she theoretically died in the bombing of Hiroshima. And the title of the poem is called Dead Girl, and it's frequently sung. It's frequently sung in commemorations of that atrocity. Given the harshness of war and the escalation of the conflict that we're in right now, it seems appropriate to reflect on his beautiful, haunting lyrics. It's short. Dead Girl, I come and stand at every door, but no one hears my tread my silent tread. I knock and yet remain unseen, for I am dead, I am dead. I'm only seven, although I died in Hiroshima a long time ago. I'm seven now, as I was then. When children die, they do not grow. My hair was scorched by swirling flame, my eyes grew dim, my eyes grew dark. Thank you. Thank you. Death came and turned my bones to dust, and that was scattered by the wind. I need no fruit, I need no rice, I need no sweets, nor even bread. I ask nothing for myself, for I am dead, for I am dead. All that I ask is that for peace, you fight today, you fight today, so that the children of the world may live and grow and laugh and play. And with that, I'd like to do a little chant and just say, <laughs>